Um, just moving on now to our last speaker of the day, um, and that's going to be Andy Barr, and he's going to give us a farmer's perspective on, uh, on IPM implementation. So Andy is an arable farmer in Mid-Kent who has uh, been gradually developing conservation, agriculture and IPM methods over many years. He's been on the BCPC disease group when he was part of the NFU crops board a few years ago. He's a, a farmer's weekly, uh, sorry, a farmer's weekly farmer focus writer. Is on the basis professional register as a, um, a, a degree in, in natural science and a PGC, a, sorry, a PG certificate in agri food. So over to you, Andy. Hello. Off you go, Andy. That's right, fine. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I've. I'm going to start off. I've likened the uh, the quest for effective IPM, the search for effective IPM, to to the quest for the Holy Grail, because that's what we've all been looking for for ages. And sometimes it seems like it's as hard to find as the as, as Sean just referred to as the Holy Grail. Um, and I'm talking about effective IPM, not just um, ticking boxes. I'm afraid. Um, I know the voluntary initiative and the NFU have done a great job. Uh, you know, staving off a pesticide tax for one thing. Um, uh, with, with the IPM plan online, but you know, I'm afraid all too often the IPM plan online is just done uh, because the farm assurance advisor is coming next week, and we've got to tick the boxes and make sure we we can show him it. Uh, it doesn't always happen like that. And Henry's uh, presentation was really interesting to me and it gave me renewed hope actually that it could be a used for a, a lot of uh, different data, but also we can have links in it that can link us to information. Uh, about how we can effectively uh, implement IPM and, and, and more importantly the economics of it to show that it actually uh, does us some good rather than uh, so more carrot and less stick that would be really really useful. Um, why is it not uh, why is IPM not adopted more well sure it is adopted almost naturally but I think for me IPM is a whole systems approach and you've got to start it from the beginning. We've got away, away from the kind of whack-a-mole farming that used to be adopted, which was right, we wait till we see a pest and then we kill it. We've got to start right from the start with a total change to our system. And uh, for me, that is direct drilling and cover crops and changing the rotation. And it's not just me, there's a whole lot of evidence out there. You know, if you, if you look at the, uh, these are some of uh, my fields when I've been direct drilling right at the start of direct drilling and you see how much residue is on the surface compared to ploughing and of course that gives a whole other habitat for insects and beneficials to live in and you know you only have to read the AHDB encyclopedia to uh, of pests and beneficials to see all the evidence that there is for lower tillage helps uh, in this respect and here's some more pictures from my farm well we've got soil that really you know, if you do plow and cultivate it, it can cap over, uh, it can cut off all the air from the soil. So you're not only creating a lot more habitat on the right there in our wheat and, and our seed rape crops down at the bottom with the residue there, but you're also increasing the soil health as well. Uh, and does it make a difference? Well, by God, this is the most uh, difference I've ever seen. Um, I do, uh, I carry out Syngenta trials on my farm um, uh, conservation agriculture trials. We have four fields on the farm and in each field there's a different point in the rotation and we have plough plots, we have min-till plots and we have direct drill plots. And here you can see the oil seed rate from last year and there's no other difference in treatment here. The left hand side was ploughed, absolutely zero oil seed rate left come the spring. The min-till had some and the direct drill had more. I have to admit it was still a poor crop even in the direct drill. But something very powerful is going on here to make that difference. It wasn't that the, the, the ploughing didn't actually come up. It wasn't quite as good, but there you can see on the left, it came up fine. It just it was absolutely hammered by cabbage stem flea beetle uh, and the min till less and the, and, the, and, the, and the direct drill even less than that. They, the the ploughing just went to completely to skeletons really and then disappeared altogether and I do wonder in a Sam alluded it to it earlier you know that, that there's work looking at how much of the leaf you can remove and 90% of the leaf can be removed and you still get the same yield but perhaps in practice you know the, the cabbage stem flea beetle doesn't stop when it's eaten 90% it carries on and has the other 10. Um, what evidence have we got? I do like to try and get some evidence. It's work in our own farm. We get a lot of uh, evidence from elsewhere, of course, but uh, in, as part of this Syngenta trials, 
Uh, we're looking at environmental sustainability as well. And there's two sites in, in the UK, Lenham, I'm on lighter land and Loddington on heavier land. And there's some quite extraordinary rises in bird sightings, especially on the heavy land site uh, and earthworm numbers, although Loddington started with much higher earthworm numbers than I did. Um, but it, that is a sign to me, you know, if we're looking at the whole ecology uh, food web, that if, if, if these big things are, are, are growing in numbers, then there must be a lot of uh, small things down below the web that are increasing as well. And I do like the uh, study that was carried out on a very close, uh, a friend of mine on a farm close to me who practices the same kind of conservation agriculture I do on the bottom left there by Greenwich University. And I'm not sure it was ever published, but they found a lot more caribou beetles on the conservation agriculture land than they did on the conventional land uh, and even on the organic land. Uh, now, why is this not? Well, I, I, to be honest, there's quite an uptake of conservation agriculture now. When I started some 10, 20 years ago, you know, it was just, you're nuts. But anyway, the, it's more difficult, frankly. It is more difficult. There is, uh, I've got a slide on the left there, which, which we're loosening soil to depth with a grass and subsoiler. And I'm only happy to do that now because you can get tighter soil if you carry on direct drilling. Not all situations, but you can. I'm only happy to do that now because I've got the right tool, which doesn't boil all the soil up to a lot of depth and it leaves most of the stubble on the top. Um, you know, other challenges, we had a hell of a game with our time direct drill with uh, straw left on the surface and it blocking up. Um, but as time goes on, you can, you can use different techniques and technologies. And once we got RTK guidance, so we could actually uh, guide our drill to within two centimeters in the field, we simply drilled the worst thing here in the middle here is spring barley straw and it's like a mattress sometimes uh, we drilled our spring barley on 25 centimeter rows and then when we came to drill the next crop the cover crop the all seed rate we simply moved over 12 centimeters and then we can drill through it uh, and it does show what you can do if you just try and tackle the problems rather than giving up uh, on the right here we've got an interesting piece of ipm actually because uh, we started off with straw rake and we straw rake was very good on slugs in after all seed rape stubbles when we we're direct drilling. Uh, however, what the straw rake also did was uh, not good for IPM because it dragged all the grass weeds around. So if you had a little patch of grass weeds, it just took it all over the field. So we've now settled on what is called a Vardastag cross cutter disc, which is a kind of a wavy disc. And it's the only thing I found that can go very shallowly, and not drag things around. And even though our neighbors probably think we're being completely crazy because they see us going up and down this field for hours on end and it's hardly made a difference. Of course, we've done it on the right and we've done it on the left and not on the right, uh, but it really makes a difference to the slugs. It really does. Um, however, you know, this can, there can be pros and cons to these. Uh, this is a, uh, in fact, 2018 BCPC uh, Pest and Beneficials Review and Anna Harper here uh, captured by Caroline Nichols, were talking about her studies on money spiders. And we heard how the money spiders, well, A, of course, they eat the aphids, but the, the more webs, they produce a lot more webs. We've, we've got stubble, and even the longer the stubble, you get more webs, and therefore more aphids consume. And um, the trouble is, of course, the more cultivation you do, if you want to get rid of slugs, then you're actually destroying the stubble. So you need to have a, a bit of a balance here. And there's some of the webs on... One of my fields, which you can see will hopefully be catching a lot of aphids, but of course, as soon as we go and spray them with cypermethrin, we would kill them off. Um, it's just not about just what we do in the field, of course. Uh, I, to me, it's, it's, you've got to think of everything in the system. And on the left there, it's not just the cover crops we've got on the right and the rotation, but on the left there, when I started farming, we, just had, we simply had a wire fence there. We had a wire fence and then it would have been ploughed over the winter. Instead of the ploughing, we've now got a cover crop. Instead of the wire fence, we've got a hedge that we planted and a cross compliance strip. And it must be a huge, you know, what, a, what an incredibly huge, hugely more habitat there is for beneficial insects in there. Uh, we also go around the edges. Anywhere we have a water course, we put a six metre margin in and we're very careful only to mow half at one time. So we have a diversity in habitats there. We, it, the list goes on and on. We've got bumblebird mix on the left there. We've got herbal lays, which we introduced to the rotation in the middle. Uh, the top right, if on the very rare occasion I get some uh, failed oil seed rape, I plant with phacelia. 
It's very quick, it's very cheap, it's very easy. And of course, bees absolutely love it. And the bottom, we have some wild bird food mix, which of course is always not only attracts the birds, but it's full of insects. Flowers, of course, we hear a lot about flowers and beneficial insects, and we've done a lot of these. And on the top left, we've got one of our younger flower mixes and the, the oxide daisies always seem to proliferate at the start. But in the middle there, you've got one which is over 20 years old, a flower corner. And we're told we need to redo them before that. But I think this one is still providing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of advantages. Uh, and on the right there, of course, we we do all these things around the edge of the field, don't we? I mean, we do them in the bag corners and think we're doing the right thing. But of course, you know, having here from the assist projects and people like that, we, 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 we come across a theory that the beneficials are only traveling perhaps 50 meters into the crop. So we're now experimenting with infield flower strips. And there's one of my infield flower strips with the uncut wheat on the right and cut on the left. And here it is developing. Um, and it looks like we've just grown it in one year because it's wheat and it's wheat, but this was actually a rare second wheat for me. So it did take us two years to get it to what it is there on the right, and we did re-drill it. And frankly, it's not, e it's not always easy because, uh, you know, in hindsight, I would have definitely have had more of a lead in time and more stale seed beds to try and get rid of the black grass that was in there. Because um, trying to treat that once it's in, in there and up and running is very difficult. You know, you can, uh, in previous experience with beetle banks, get very prone with thistles. Uh, so you need to, we need more information on what we can do to these flower corners and margins and strips down the middle, I think. And also, you know, we can get paid for a lot of these things, but crucially, uh, I think I should get paid for these infield strips and as an infield grass strip, which is fine, but I'm currently waiting on my countryside stewardship application to it should have started at the beginning of January and of course I haven't had a reply whether it's actually starting yet. Um, are these actually making a difference? Well we're also doing a cover crop trial with Syngenta and here it is from the air. We've got some strips of different cover crops. We've got my farm standard which is quite diverse so uh, gives a lot of different rooting and different plants but uh, not as actually much coverage as the standard for celia oats or radish on the right there. And in fact, this year, they're pretty poor in terms of cover crops because they went in late because of the weather. We've got the beetle bank, which is what they're calling the infield grass flower strip there. And we've got the untreated. And we go around with a hoover or someone's gone around with a, effectively a hoover and, and found uh, that we do indeed have more insects in our cover crops. We do indeed have way more insects in our beetle bank flower strip. Although on the right there, you can see there is a bit of a question mark over species diversity, which we need to look into. Other things we tried in crop in field are of course companion crops which were alluded to earlier. Uh, I've done them for seven or eight years now. In fact we tried vetch up on the left there, we tried bursim and uh, crimson clover on the bottom left. Uh, I've even left them till you know right through the crop in the middle there. You can see them poking out of the, the Aussie rape pods uh, and one of my favorites is actually beans on the right. Um, and do they make a difference? Well they do make a difference, just like Sean said, they don't, they, 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 everything makes a little bit of a difference. And you can see this is one of the times I actually did back in the early days of companion cropping, I actually had a control on the left there. I just grow them everywhere now because they do do some good, I'm convinced. But there you go, it's got a, it was put in by a subsoil, it's absolutely ravaged by a flea beetle on the left. And the middle one, we've got peas, we've got beans, we've left all the volunteers like Sam alluded to earlier, they also help. And we've got much better RC grape. You can see, though, it's still being attacked by the flea beetle. Uh, but we have got a crop. And in, indeed, that stuff on the left disappeared completely. And on the right, once we apply the astro curb, the beauty of uh, going for a legume over, over going for, for a brassica is that you can apply astro curb, which you probably would apply anyway, and that will kill the legumes off. Whereas with the, with the, if you're putting the brassicas in, you need to carefully and riskily perhaps time the clear field approach you are left uh, with a, a not, uh, with a rape crop although again you know it was a rape crop that didn't yield very well uh, and this is some of this was stuff done by Max uh, at Syngenta and you can see we did actually get less damage in the companion crop from flea beetle than we did from the untreated and less in the direct drilling uh, in fact I've had um, other results from other agronomists where we've, we've got an even uh, a bit more of an advantage from growing companion crops and perhaps some of Sam work was suggesting that as well. However, it does tell a story that you get a bit of an advantage. You, you, it's not like the old days when <laughs> you just did one thing 
boom, pest gone. You have to, I think, you have to get all of these little advantages and stack them all up on top of each other to be effective. Um, we have got, it's not just us, that, that graph down in the middle bottom there was French work and they've done a lot more, they've far uh, advanced on us on, on this front and they've done a lot more work and they've got less larvae in the, in the companion crop stems. Uh, and we in fact got a lot more biomass generally. You can see this is my control strip of no companion crop one year and either side it's got those pea, uh, obviously rape and beans that are on the left. And there's a hell of a lot, although we've got a crop in the middle, there's a hell of a lot more biomass on the left and right. Uh, in the Syngenta trials, we, we, this was one year before the really bad flea beetle hit and um, we cut open a lot of stems and we've got the plow plot, the mintil and the direct drilling and we found a lot more larvae in the plow plots. There's no doubt about it and a lot less in the direct drill plots. So that is great. In this year, before it was really bad flea beetle, there were slugs, there were slug problems and of course we had more slug problems in the direct drill plot. So there are some swings and roundabouts to be enjoyed here. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is in fact that Vardastag crop cutter, cross cutter disc I was referring to, uh, just so you know what it looks like. Um, we've also tried companion cropping, uh, we've tried companion cropping in wheat as well. And, you know, I spoke to a chap from Igers a long time ago who had really got excellent uh, reductions in aphid pressure with clover by crop with wheat. The big problem is actually doing it practically. It's really difficult. I've tried it. I either get too much wheat and not enough clover or too much clover and not enough wheat. And frankly, at the moment, I've given up. Uh, I've spoken to quite a few people in the kind of conservation ag sector who've done similar things, and it's very tricky. So if anyone can find a way of doing that consistently and, and not having a decreased wheat yield, that'd be really good. Uh, I've tried track crops like we heard about earlier. Uh, on the left, I had some, um, in fact, it was neonic treated uh, kale seed there because you're still allowed to put neonics on kale at that point. Um, uh, and I put it in the field. In fact, that was still eaten by flea beetle. Uh, we, tried turn, we tried mustard on the right there. I planted the mustard earlier and uh, it's very little damaged by flea beetle, frankly. And it, uh, it had a lot of turnip saw fly in it and things like that. Didn't think it did much good. And in the middle, I finally got around to planting the right thing that Sam uh, suggested, which was turnip rape. And we did plant it in front of the oilseed rape. And the trouble is, of course, you can see the scale. It doesn't really make a difference to me, but you can see the scale that I'm doing it on. You know, maybe up to that tram line, it made a difference. But, you know, if I've simply got a six meter strip around the whole of the field, which in farming terms is quite practical and easy, it's not, you know, the 10% uh, of the field that Sam was referring to earlier. So, which would be a lot harder, of course. So we've given up on that one as well at the moment. Um, manure, dung, sludge, you know, there's a lot of people have, have, well, quite a few people have had some good effect with this, um, but what I've done, I use what is available to me, which has been compost and my own farmyard manure, and I haven't had a great effect of that. I think it's simply not smelly enough, not potent enough, and the people that have had success are people who've used uh, sewage sludge, who've used uh, digestate from AD plants, who've used pig slurry, things like that. Uh, and that's great uh, and it, it should be useful, but of course it does is another conflict here because that doesn't go well with direct drilling. Um, we've also had a little experiments with grazing sheep with the, uh, there's the idea we can eat the larvae out of the obviously rape and um, we tried a little bit with our cover crops here and this is a radish cover crop and we tried the sheep on it and uh, I think it's going to be tricky. I think A, you've got to get a very big rape crop to start with. I also think it's very difficult. You have to ha have a tame shepherd or a tame owner of sheep uh, to get them off exactly the right time. And it's not something for the faint hearted. Of course, right at the start, you can just start, uh, as Alan alluded to earlier, with, with varieties. And so as, as someone who doesn't want to imply insecticides, I've start with the varieties right at the beginning when they come out. Unfortunately, I started with Amelie straight away as it can be available and Amelie obviously rape and even in the absence of any spraying on my farm Amelie consistently yielded less than any of the other RC rape on my farm. Uh, of course things come on and with the advent of a spire conventional one and an ambassador and in fact most of the uh, highest yielding varieties on the list now are all TUYV resistant which is great but 
I've also tried Amistar barley, Raffaella barley. I've tried a mix of Amistar and Raffaella. I tried RGT Wolverine last year, and there's no doubt that they yield less. Amistar and Raffaella definitely have cost me money by taking up this trait. The Wolverine was meant to yield the same as everything else, but had a bad year last year. And I'm really hoping that KWS Ferris, which is a new barley, you know, will come up uh, and, and actually get us to the stage where we're, we're getting as much yield with the rest of the varieties. And, and this is a case of what we've been alluded to earlier. It's got to be economic to, uh, to adopt IPM. And this is, you know, adopting IPM in these instances is actually costing me money. What really frustrates me is they talk about the, the traits of these BYDV tolerance being around genetically for 20 or 30 years. But of course the economics weren't there because you simply sprayed. It was why put anything into research to bring these genetics forward when you could just spray cypromethrin. So we really need to be on the lookout for any of these kind of situations coming in the future and make sure that that kind of long-term false economics doesn't carry on. Uh, also at the beginning, we, we actually brew up microbes and uh, we brew and we put them down via that front tank and a lot of piping down with the seed via our drill and we have nitrogen fixing pea solubilizing microbes uh, and one of those things is to reduce nitrogen which I might mention in a minute uh, and which might in turn reduce pests but the other thing is we're now putting down some silica uh, with the seed and we are thinking that this is helping which I'll come on to. Uh, we're trying to reduce our nitrogen as well. I mean we heard earlier about how the price of nitrogen is going to reduce nitrogen. We get a lot of anecdotal evidence that less nitrogen, less frothy crops is a word that Sean used, uh, you know, can be less susceptible to pests and diseases. I think we need a bit more research and, um, and evidence that that's the case, because I'd, I'd really like to investigate that. But we're doing everything we can to reduce nitrogen with things like putting molasses and fulvic acids and humic acids with it so that we can use less nitrogen. We're trying to keep the crop as healthy as possible by doing a lot of foliar testing of the sap and the tissue. Uh, and these are results here on the right. And then we can put that right with a foliar root to keep the plant as healthy as possible so that it can keep the pests away without having to spray. We've also done in, uh, trials on row spacing and uh, you can see different wheat row spacing on the left there. And on the right, you can see where we tried some dr grid drilling. So drilling both ways on the, in the far bit of that picture there. Uh, I think it helped with weeds. I honestly don't see if it's helped any at all with pests. Uh, we were advised at one point that wider row spacing and honestly rate might help, but I need some more work on that. Thresholds. God, someone referred to me, you know, I'm really frustrated about thresholds. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at the thresholds, some don't really have a threshold. For example, uh, autumn aphids, although you could say 10% of plants, but uh, a lot of the thresholds are frankly just anecdotal or not peer reviewed um, and some of them, you know, like the pollen beetle, uh, I, I did a lot actually with Sam a few years ago and I, I, I trapped a lot of pollen beetle and beneficials on white sticky, on yellow sticky traps. And there was a simple threshold then and our, our thresh, the pollen beetle would come up to the threshold and go down, come up and go down. And that's when I first thought, you know, thresholds. Uh, that, that's when I first thought that actually there's a lot being done by beneficials here that we could benefit from. Because if we'd sprayed, we'd have just killed all the beneficials as well. Um, but also it taught me, just don't spray for pollen beetle. Forget about thresholds in pollen beetle, don't spray. And as we heard earlier from Patricia, I think it was, there's no good time to spray to avoid beneficials. Well, if you play for, spray for pollen beetle, you'll kill some of those beneficials you need in your, in your next RC rate crop. Um, talking of not spraying, uh, and, and uh, Sean was talking about this as well with the brookid beetle. Here are some results from my brookid uh, beetle beans over the last couple of uh, few years. And I send all my beans to Wheel Granary, which is a storage marketing co-op. Uh, there's results from 2017, 2018. The, the figures in the box there are what they measure for a load, a 30 tonne load going into store. 2017, I had brew kid levels of 3.7 was typical of my loads. And you can see the amount of feed beans they had, i.e. too high in brew kid beetle and the amount of human consumptions they had, i.e. under about 5%. And I didn't spray. And I know for a fact that most people did spray. And by not spraying, I had lower brew kid. 
And in 2018, I had, uh, they hardly had any come in that were under the magic 5% brew key. And I had a one, one load out of those 43 tons was mine, the 4.4 that hadn't been sprayed. And uh, in 2019, I think pre-pandemic, I was doing talks and presenting this and, uh, you know, hopefully I wasn't being too bullish because, um, in fact, I didn't grow any in 2019. In 2020, you know, just when you think you've cracked it, 2020 comes back and I've got 15% brew kit by not spraying. And that is, I'm afraid, uh, a kind of IPM story in a nutshell. Uh, talking about spraying, I haven't sprayed uh, any cereals for 13, 14 years now, uh, although I was using neonitinoid seed treatments. And of course, when the neonitinoids uh, were on the way out, I thought, God, the last thing I want to do is start spraying now. Um, so I used all the support I could get, the BYDV management tools. I looked at the T-sums, you know, and we then uh, started looking at the aphid news, the rossensor traps, et cetera, et cetera. And we used this to keep the, the um, water traps. And uh, I sent them off in those Petri dishes to Fira. And you can see I did, uh, I did two fields each year for a couple of years and over five to six weeks. And in, in all of those tests, I don't know how many there were, probably about 20 odd I sent off, we found one aphid. And, you know, it was costing me over 500 quid a year. Uh, this was on, you know, I'm sowing in mid-October. So we found one aphid. And uh, I've stopped doing it now because it was just seemed to be a waste of time and money. Um, of course, there are things you can do which don't necessarily, uh, you know, kill all your beneficials, hopefully, as well. Uh, um, we, we need a bit of manganese on our crops. And uh, we were using an ad adjuvant called Transformer, which is orange oil. And incidental, incidentally, orange oil can dry up aphids. You have to hit them. It's no good if you're doing it on peas, we found, because, of course, the aphids are inside the, um, the leaves. Uh, so cabbage stem flea beetle, which is another one of the major ones, of course. Back to that again. Uh, timing, of, timing of drilling. We're just talking about the timing of drilling on the, old, on the winter wheat and how that's helped us. Um, and it really has helped us with the, with the BYDV. But uh, I was finding it much more difficult on the whole seed rate because, you know, there was talk of planting early, you'd miss it, or planting late, you'd miss it. And uh, over the last couple of years, two or three years, I was really cunningly managing to plant my whole seed rate despite my best efforts at exactly the time where there was a big migration in my area. Uh, you know, I even tried planting it late the year before. And of course, it was late, a late bit of sun in Kent. Uh, and I got hammered by a flea beetle. So this year, I thought I'm going to spread my risk and I'll plant some early. And on the left there, you've got early August planted oilseed rape. And on the middle picture is mid-September planted oilseed rape. And these pictures were both taken on the 29th of September the, last year. And you can see which one I'd rather have, the one on the left. But often in years gone by, you know, the early drilled crops have been full of larvae. Uh, this wasn't, it's, this just hasn't got larvae in the stems. And I can only assume it was early, early enough that it just missed the, the stage where it was attractive to the flea beetle at all. The stuff on the right, despite being the 15th of September, which is getting pretty late enough because anywhere after that, and you're getting all kinds of other risks, still managed to coincide with a, a kind of Indian summer down in Kent where there was more flea beetle flying around and it did get hit by flea beetle. Uh, you can see on the right there in December that it is a nice, it is an actual healthy looking crop now, albeit much smaller. Uh, and how do we do this? Well, we've been trying, uh, we've experimented with silica lately and we tried a few different products and we tried them at drilling and then we tried putting them on foliary as well. And we think now with putting them in, getting ahead of the game, putting them on uh, actually down with the drill and then putting uh, at least two, two sprays of silica on when you're going through with other stuff, uh, really strengthens the stems and, and, and the, the flea beetle larvae seem to be burrowing in, but almost, uh, they almost seem to be falling out. They, they, you've made the stems so strong. And compared to uh, a neighbor of mine who also has got some very good odd seed rate, but he planted some late in the middle of, September as well uh, and he didn't get any silica spray on it and they are really dying out from the middle so it's all anecdotal uh, but we're quite hopeful about that and we're also looking into some potassium silicate now which you've got to be a bit careful with with the mixing of but um, it could be used on all sorts of other crops as well to to strengthen 
the plant tissue against pest attack. Uh, but I'm going to leave you with um, my most useful favorite emoji when coming to farming and in particular IPM, and that is the slap face or dope emoji, because sometimes no matter how hard you try, uh, I've got an example on the picture on the left, on the right here. Uh, and this was this, this later, this was part of the field that was later drilled this year with oilseed rape. And it was a dog leg that I'd had of the field that I'd had in herbal lay. So herbal lay, fantastic, you know, good for the soil, lengthening the rotation, etc. Trouble is I couldn't get the sheep off it because there was no other grass anywhere else. And of course they didn't want me to, they didn't want to move their sheep because they didn't have anywhere to put them. So then it was too rough for direct drilling. So I cultivated and the only difference here was that I cultivated. So you see the pictures previously of the, the healthy oil seed rape and this dog leg was cultivated. We drilled it in the middle of September, failed completely. Had companion crop had in row nutrition, had silica, failed completely. Redrilled it at the end of September. We thought the flea beetle must have gone by now, but they're probably still in the field, failed completely again. And here it is now morphed into beans, drilled <laughs> in November. Uh, and uh, so I'm leaving you with uh, the downside of IPM, but uh, perhaps it tells a story. Thank you.